Welcome back to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Picciuto. Uh Happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, today is Wednesday, March 17th. Um, and on today's episode, I want to uh, kind of recap a couple of things that have gone on in the last week. Um, first, uh, touching on uh, the Bachelor episode uh, that aired on Monday, the, uh, the finale, the After the Rose. Uh, diving uh, a little bit into a movie review that I just saw this week, um, which was Cherry uh, with Tom Holland. And then uh, finally, touching on uh, sports free agency, football free agency, and uh, some of the Giants' moves um, over the last couple of days. Um, so first things first, uh, I am uh, a recent convert and avid uh, viewer of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette franchise. Um, obviously, this year has been a bit of a shit show. Um, just everything that's gone on with the pandemic. Um, uh, Matt James, who I, I'm a big fan of, being the uh, the first black Bachelor. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, race issues at hand and like just a ton of drama over the course of the season. Um, we had some girls self... Uh, you know, self-remove themselves from the beginning of the year because of family stuff. Um, you know, just it's just been in a, a season unlike any other. Um, and then obviously the uh, the finale. Um, you know, Matt chooses Rachel, and then all of the racial implications that came up with her past, um, with the Lady Antebellum parties in college. Um, you know, liking problematic uh, stuff on Instagram and Facebook and whatnot, and. Uh, all in all, I, like I enjoyed the season. I thought it, uh, I thought Matt did a good job. I'm sure he had a lot more on his plate um, than he kind of let on. Um, there was a ton of pressure on him uh, being the first bachelor. Um, he definitely carried with himself a lot of unresolved issues with his. Uh, parents uh relationship and uh and their breakup and it was a little tough to watch at times um he seems like such a genuinely good dude and a person who's uh constantly trying to uh you know assess his position in uh you know not just his life but like the the grand scheme of the the franchise and 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 his you know newfound fame and whatnot and uh he became a person who's like super easy to root for he wanted him to find Uh, the person that he was supposed to, you know, fall in love with and and marry. And you could see throughout the course of the season that he was very consistently reiterating uh, that that's what he was there for. He was looking for his person. He was looking to settle down. He was looking to get engaged. And uh, I think the disappointing thing is how towards the end of the season, how conflicted he was um, because of conversations that he had with his parents. And uh, for all of his um, constant reiterations of what he was looking for and what he was ultimately going to uh, hopefully find at the end of the show, he uh, he didn't end up having that uh, success in the end. Um, I think it's uh, obviously super unfortunate when someone who has such problematic shit like Rachel had come up at the end um, like that, and, and certainly after the the season had uh, started, uh, you know, excuse me, finished recording, you know, uh, and, and all those things came out while they were probably dating and, you know, and or spending time together after the show. And uh, I can't imagine that those were uh, easy conversations to have. And uh, also very sad because, you know, you're rooting for Matt, you're, you're thinking he found someone. And then obviously watching the season back, we all knew about all the problematic stuff that was going to come out. Um, and, uh, it was just unfortunate. Um, it seemed like Rachel really loved him. And obviously these are those instances where things you say and do in your past can come back to haunt you. Um, and, and obviously there, there's a level of forgiveness that Matt, um, gave to her and, uh, she copped to a lot of this stuff and, uh, kind of just, you know, reiterated that she made mistakes and, and that's all well and good. Um, it's just ultimately really unfortunate, um, for the two of them as a couple. Um, I think, uh, it'll be curious to see what happens with either of them, uh, moving forward. Um, like I said, Matt's a guy you root for. Um, he's, he seems like a a super positive, um, good person that you want to see be successful and happy in his life. And, uh, Rachel's obviously super young and she's made some mistakes. And, uh, you know, my hope is that like she, she uses this as a, as a really good learning opportunity. Um, and uh and grows from this um you know it's it's i I recently uh recorded a podcast with a friend of mine from ireland and 
it's it's just sad where we seem to be as a country, um, really as a, as a human race um, in this day and age. Um, racism is is worse than ever, um, and 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 it just seems like we're reaching a, a boiling point and tipping point where um, push really needs to come to shove here. And uh, you know, it's it's just really alarming um, how fractious uh, the population seems to be. And uh, it's, you know, without getting super into the race politics and everything that's going on in the world right now, um, I, I'm, I just got to hope that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. And, uh, you know, as far apart as we may seem today, uh, hopefully sometime in the near future, um, we can start mending some fences and healing some wounds and, uh, and come together. Um, I, on Monday or Tuesday, watched the movie Cherry, uh, starring Tom Holland um, and some actress I wasn't familiar with, Um, and it was, I believe, written and directed by the Russo brothers who did all of the Marvel movies. Um, While I thought Tom Holland and uh, the female actress, who's, you know, unfortunately slipping my mind right now, um, put some pretty stellar performances uh, in play, the movie was just not very good. Um... You can see what uh, the Russo brothers were going for in the story that they were telling. You can understand what they thought they were making, uh, perhaps at the time uh, that they were making this movie. Um, It's just two plus hours of uh, a lot of drama, and I don't think there was much conflict resolution. It was just... Um, you, you could kind of watch it and think about the movie that they were trying to make, but they were ultimately possibly incapable of, of making. Um, there were some really stellar performances by a number of the people in the movie, but I don't think the story was there. I don't think uh, the ebb and flow of the movie really uh, suited uh, the, the running time. And uh, all in all, I would say four out of 10, um, maybe five out of 10, just based on, I thought Tom Holland was really exceptional in the role. Um, although the the overarching cohesiveness and or totality of the film just wasn't really great uh, at all. Um, I also watched No Man Land with Frances McDermott, who I believe just won a Golden Globe for her performance in the movie. And uh, that to me is another good example of a film that, uh, you know, an individual performance can probably end up carrying uh, the film uh, at large. I think the film might have won the Golden Globe for Best Picture, which uh, it, it is a bit startling to me. Um, the movie was too long, too slow, too dry, too drawn out. Um, while McDermott was exceptional um, and a really truly gritty performance, um, nothing happens in the movie. I, I mean, I, it's one of those things that, you know, it'll probably win Oscar for Best Picture, and hundreds of people will disagree with this, but there was no part about the movie that I found captivating. Um, there was nothing about the story um, that I uh, connected with. Um, I, it just felt super dry. Um, and another example of one of those films that they make to make you think about, you know, this uh, nomad generation of people who've lost their homes, their jobs, and they're living out of a van. And obviously that's fucking horrible. But you know, just because you tackle a difficult subject, I don't necessarily think you have a good movie on your hands. And this is one of those examples. Um, the cinematography was pretty beautiful. Um, I will say they, they shot some beautiful shots. Um, a lot of the pacing was good. Um, but the movie, by and large, just didn't strike me as something that was good. Um, and uh, unfortunately... Uh, I had pretty high expectations going into it, especially after all that uh, transpired with the uh, Golden Globes. And uh, like I said, Frances McDermott was very good in her role. Um, I, I, I would pass another four, four or five out of ten. Uh, you know, it's it's too, it's a bit too long. Um, it felt repetitive at times. Uh, you're obviously drawn into the uh, the character based on uh, Frances McDermott's performance, um, but that's pretty much where where the movie stops. Uh, and lastly, uh, for this episode, obviously it's going to be probably a bit on the shorter side. Um, I want to discuss NFL free agency, start of the new league year, and uh, as a Giants fan, my utter dismay and lack of 
really any confidence in what this regime is putting together. Um, if you're unfamiliar, the Giants made a couple moves, uh, starting off with signing a backup running back, Devontae Booker, to a two-year, $6 million contract. Now, they haven't released the financials in terms of what is um, guaranteed in the deal and or what the you know totality is in terms of dollars up front and bonuses and the whole nine yards. But it's, uh, it's difficult for me to look at... Uh, what we currently have in the backfield, Wayne Gallman and or uh, Devontae Freeman at a fraction of that price and think that we needed to go out and sign a 29-year-old running back for a backup role and give him $3 million of uh, cap charge for this season. Um, let alone the fact that Booker is receiving what amounts to a three or four times pay increase um, when he was the third or fourth running back on the depth chart for the Raiders last year. Um, it's these kind of off-the-wall, uh, illogical signings that I think just really inhibits your ability to look at Dave Gettleman over the last three or four years and think he's been doing a good job as the general manager of the New York Giants. Um Additionally, we re-signed Leonard Williams, which I think is obviously was our number one priority after franchise tagging him. Uh, if you can give me any sort of indication or idea of what uh, the necessity was um, or the logic behind a three-year contract for $60-plus million, plus um, which has just dramatic cap implications over the next uh, three seasons, um, why was he not signed to a five-year contract? Why was that cap charge not pushed out long term? Uh, likely, this is a two year deal, and that third year, whether he's cut or traded or what have you, uh, there will be a massive cap charge on the books for three years from now. Now, obviously, there's some television money that comes into play in the future and uh, the salary cap going up versus down like it did this year because of COVID. Um, still, uh, it's just one of those additional head scratching uh, moves by a team that just doesn't make uh, dollars and cents. Um, that was an unintended pun. But in, in actuality, uh, that contract should have been stretched out over a longer period of time. You're basically giving uh, him the ability to walk uh, and really just hurt ourselves from a cap perspective. And we already have a messy cap situation as is. Um, it's, it's just tragic to me that we're, we're going to have a rookie quarterback contract that's going to end in a couple seasons, and our our cap situation is just an utter mess. Um, the only thing that we can hope for is that uh, every game gets played in front of a crowd this year and the salary cap goes up dramatically uh, for the 2022 season. But, you know, uh, Leonard Williams is a re-sign. Devontae Booker is an, you know, an outside sign. We signed John Ross to a one-year contract, the wide receiver from Cincinnati. Um, I think he's got good potential. Um, but there's nothing that they're doing today uh, or, you know, or p potentially doing over the next couple days um, to me, that looks like uh, something that's going to improve this team. Um, it's it's uh, it's a tough day for a Giants fan when um, we're announcing the re-signing of our kicker, our long snapper, and our placeholder, and those are getting rave reviews. And all of our other major signings are sort of like, what are they thinking? Um, it's it's a uh, it's it's really tough <laughs> tough to be a giant fan uh, in this day um, because it just doesn't seem like they have any idea of what they're doing um, in terms of filling out their roster. Now we have a relatively high draft pick. I believe it's top ten. It might be seven. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what uh, what pick it actually is. So obviously we should be able to get an impactful player at that position. Um, but it, you know it's just more or less uh, more of the same. Um, you look at the moves that have been made over the last couple seasons, and you've got some really good signings uh, like Blake Martinez, uh, Bradbury, um, and then you just like just have to scratch your head at the James Stewart signings, the Devontae Booker signing. I mean, $3 million, the guy was making $800,000 last year. What did he do to warrant uh, a 300% increase in salary. He had, I think, like 65 carries and 60 catches and like 600 total yards on the season. Um, why would we not have spent a little bit less money 
uh, or just drafted a running back in the third or fourth or fifth or sixth round. Um, it just, the, the dollars and cents of it doesn't make sense. And uh, when you look at where this team is and where uh, we're going, there doesn't seem to be a cohesive plan. Um, and, and you're staring at year three of Daniel Jones, unless he makes miraculous strides uh, in, term to, in terms of his on-field play, um, unless we are able to secure uh, you know, a legitimate wide receiver threat, either by the draft or by free agency, there's still some time left, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a year later and, and the team's not any better. We're not improved. Um, we re-signed or restructured Nate Solder, which which uh, I think is obviously a good move. Um, with a year off, he's got a good chance to be fresh. Um, letting Kevin Zeitler, cutting him, taking that dead money cap charge um, when he was arguably one of our better linemen last year doesn't make much sense to me. He got less money than uh, we were paying him on his new uh, contract but we could have easily just restructured him and brought him back into the fold. So the offensive line seems to be in flux, um, which is what we spent the last two drafts addressing. Um, you know, it, we let Dalvin Tomlinson walk in free agency. Um, there just doesn't seem to be a plan in place. And if there is one, obviously it's not up for them to explain it to us, but I would just like to have them write it down, put it in an envelope and say, you know, on September 5th or whenever week one is, this is what we were aiming to do and then see where it actually lined up with what uh, what was done. Because at the end of the day, uh, there doesn't seem to be um, a cohesive plan in place. And it, uh, it's an alarming position to be in. We're multiple years into a rebuild and uh, we're not entirely uh, seeing any light at the end of the tunnel here. So yeah, uh, to say that I'm alarmed and, and you know in terms of where the franchise is headed uh, would be an understatement. Um, when you look at uh, teams like Dallas having all of their pieces in place for another year and a healthy DAC, um, I mean you know it remains to be seen what Jalen Hurts is going to do in Philadelphia. I mean the NFC East is still largely wide open, um, and at the end of the day, I don't necessarily think the moves that we've made this week or uh, to date, uh, put us in any better of a position to be competitive. Um, and, you know, listen, I, I stand to be corrected if Daniel Jones comes out next year, uh, not, doesn't turn the ball over, uh, looks like a new quarterback, um, looks like the answer that uh, Gettleman thinks he is. Um, so at the end of the day, I, you know, I would love to be proven wrong. Um, it just doesn't necessarily seem plausible uh, or likely at this point. Um, I think you're looking at another 8-8 eight and eight season or – you know, worse. Um, eight and eight might be best case scenario right now, even though they haven't released a schedule. Um, I, I just am not looking at this team as something that can be overly competitive, and that's super frustrating. Um, listen, we get a, a healthy Saquon back this year. If the offensive line comes together in the offseason uh, and training camp, sure, there are potentials um, for this team to be good. Um, but that is likely just the, uh, you know, the, the fan in me. Uh, wishing out loud uh, that something like that transpires. So that's it for today's episode. I mean, I touched on a couple things that I wanted to discuss. Um, I, I, I think the uh, the movies are uh, a bit of a letdown. Um, I, I thought The Bachelor was uh, was enjoyable. I'm curious to see what the next couple seasons look like without uh, Chris Harrison on board and uh, with Katie and Michelle's season. Um, they both seem like super awesome women. I, I really hope that they uh, both have successful outcomes. Uh, it seems as of late that not a lot of these relationships are lasting, which obviously is not a huge surprise given uh, what the show is about, but uh, it does give people a little bit of hope for love. Um, Want to end today's podcast with a super random recommendation, but I have recently started getting into the habit of using liquid IV hydration packages. Um, this is not an ad, um, but please, by all means, if you guys want to sponsor me, I would love to get more of this stuff. It is rather pricey, um, but they're basically these electrolyte uh, packages, like little um, slips of powder that you put in your water bottle. And not only do they taste pretty good, kind of like a, you know, a, a lemon limey kind of Gatorade 
uh, ish flavor. Um, every time I drink these, I feel really good. Um, I feel more hydrated and know that's a cheesy cliche thing to say, but I actually just feel good. Um, it's a bit surprising. Um, and, uh, I was shocked when I got them that uh, I enjoyed them so much and I felt so good after using them that every time I run out, uh, I'm pissed that I got to wait two or three days from Amazon to get them uh, delivered to me again. Uh, so liquid IV hydration, uh, highly recommend. Uh, they are a little bit pricey, but I think they're worth it. Uh, especially like if you're hungover or if you plan on drinking a night, uh, having one or two of those bad boys, uh, will probably make, uh, a real difference. So that's the end of uh, episode seven, uh, short and sweet, just the way I like it. Uh, next episode coming up, uh, should be the, uh, interview that I have with my friend Freya. Um, she is a, uh, Irish, uh, girl, uh, really awesome human being, someone I'm, I'm super happy to call a friend. Uh, so be on the lookout for that episode to drop hopefully sometime next week. Um, and yeah, as always, uh, please feel free to uh, like this episode, subscribe to the uh, to the podcast, leave a review. It really does make an impact. And uh, be sure to follow along on my Twitter and Instagram at John Pachuto and look forward to catching up with you guys in the next one. Take care.